thank you for being here. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank the entire M4 Music uh, team for having us. It's been a great experience the last two days, and uh, today is sort of the finale for us uh, before we venture off back to our home countries. So, you know, in the music business, some of us have been here for maybe a year or two, maybe a decade, but there are very few people that have been in the business for over half a century and still continue to follow their passion, make a difference, and inspire the global music community. And the gentleman to my right is certainly that individual. So there's a lot to talk about here. So I'm going to be as concise and precise as possible because we're going to try to squeeze in 50 years into one hour, which is virtually impossible. So to my right, let's give a very nice warm welcome to the legendary Mr. Harvey Goldsmith. You know, people say in life sometimes legends are created, but rarely are they born, and Harvey was born way before my time. In fact, he's been in the business before I was even born. He began in the music business professionally in 1966 and is known for, for his uh, performing arts promotions company, Live Aid, Live Eight, The Prince's Trust, and of course is one of the biggest promoters in rock music. Harvey has produced, managed, and promoted shows with some of the biggest names in the business, including Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd, Queen, Eagles, Alton John, U2, Madonna, Andre Bocelli, Muse, Bob Dylan, The Rolling Stones, The Who, Bruce Springsteen, Santana, Bee Gees, Oasis, Dinah Ross, Rod Stewart, Coldplay, Eric Clapton, Van Morrison, Yes, Sting, and I'm just getting started, so I'll stop there. But that gives you a little taste of what Harvey's done in his uh, incredible career. In 1973, he formed Artiste Management Productions Limited to produce and manage artists in the music industry. And in 1976, Harvey Goldsmith Entertainment Limited was formed, which became the UK's leading promoter of concert and events. In 1985, he organized Live Aid with Bob Geldof, which became a 140 million pound fundraising venture in less than 10 weeks. Following Live Aid, Harvey Goldsmith became involved with concerts in aid of human rights, including a worldwide amnesty tour. He joined the Prince's Trust in 1982 and produced, produced the first Prince's Trust rock gala Harvey then became a member of the Princess Trust Board and Vice Chairman of Princess Trust Trading Limited. In 1992, Harvey organized the Freddie Mercury Tribute Concert to increase AIDS awareness, and this was also a large TV success. In the same year, he became Chairman of the first National Music Day, which was instigated to promote the importance of music in the UK. In 2002, Harvey Goldsmith Productions was formed to carry the legacy of leading concert and events promotions. See, Harvey, if I didn't have the wine last night, I would have memorized all this. <laughs> it's all your fault. In 2006, Harvey was awarded the Chevalier de Arts Latis from the French Minister of Culture. He presented the dance spectacular The Merchants of Bollywood, the first ever Bollywood production to tour straight from Film City in Mumbai. In 2009, Harvey was presented the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Outdoors Events Industry by the National Outdoor Events Association. And if Harvey wasn't busy enough, in 2009, he became the manager of Jeff Beck. In 2012, the University of Brighton presented Gold so Harvey Goldsmith with an honorary degree of Doctor of the Arts. And now today, Harvey is a chairman of the British Music Experience, the UK's, music, sorry, the UK's only museum of contemporary music from 1946 to the present. Harvey is also a board member of Editorial Intelligence, Captive Minds, and investment board member of Edge VCT. Harvey is also on the board of Imagination, a Dutch immersive theater company. Harvey, you're a very busy man. <laughs> yes, give him a round of applause. That's very impressive. So Harvey, let's, there's so much to talk about, but let's start off with what inspired you to get into music. Frustration, basically. Um, uh, very simply, I went to university 
to study pharmacy, to be a pharmacist. Um, funnily enough, it put me in very good stead when I got into music, but that wasn't the reason. And I, I wanted to do, a, I, I was fascinated about uh, perfumery and cosmetics and how they were sold, how they were marketed. And I chose to do a particular course and I went down to uh, the College of Technology, which was part of uh, Sussex University. And um, six weeks after the course started, um, we were told that the grants and the government hadn't come through and they were going to delay the course for a year. And I got very angry about it, and I thought, this is no good, This I don't want to waste a year. So I didn't know what to do. Uh, we were given a choice to uh, register for a London University degree externally, which is the one degree I didn't want to do, it was too theoretical, and I was interested in the practical side of, of pharmacy. Anyway. So I went to a student union meeting and um, there were representatives of every single course at the student union and I listened to them talking about the football club, the rugby club, the chess club, the bridge club, the disc club, the that club. And I said, okay, where's the social life? I'm in Brighton on the coast, there's no social life. And they said, we've just been through it all. I said, no, no, where's, where's the fun? Where's the music? Whatever. And the president of the union said, well, okay, what do, you, what do you think we should do? I said, I think we should open a club. And they all kind of everybody giggled and laughed. And they said, all right, open a club. I said, okay, I will. So I opened a club for students in uh, January 1966. And by March 1966, you couldn't get into the club. And that's really that started my pathway. So... You obviously went from, you know, getting into the business in 1996, as you mentioned, but you've obviously been involved in so many different facets from management to promoting to charitable causes to TV to, uh, you know, theatrical experiences and what have you. So out of all these different experiences that you've had in your incredibly impressive career, what would you say has been the most inspiring part of what you do day to day which one of those elements uh, everything starts from music really I mean I I believe right from the beginning even though I, I was a music promoter I believed that we were providing entertainment so I looked at talent and the stage is a very important kind of castle and the edge of the stage is the wall of the castle and it didn't matter whether it was opera or uh, classical music, or rock music, or pop music, or jazz, or whatever, if somebody could stand inside that castle and project across the wall, which is the end of the stage, and get to the audience, and that audience would pay attention, then that artist had talent, and they deserved a platform. That's the way I saw it. So for me, I've spent most of my life doing a variety of different forms of entertainment because I think that's important. So, uh, for example, um, I brought Cirque du Soleil over to Europe, to England, because I heard about them. They were playing, they just did their first show outside Canada. They play, were playing at the end of the pier in Santa Monica. I went to see them. It took me two years to persuade them to come over, but they came over and... Cirque du Soleil have been a massive, massive worldwide success ever since. I saw artists that I just knew were going to work. Um, many years rolled on. I, I, I was in New York. Um, and, and, and the other thing I believe, that um, the world is a big place, but it's actually quite small. And I didn't feel that talent only came from England and I could only work in England. So at a very early stage in my life, I started to travel and I started to realise it's a big world and there's music everywhere. There's music in Europe, there's music in, uh, in South America, there's music in Asia and of course there's music in America. So I used to go, I was one of the only English promoters that ever went to America and so everybody knew me. 
So that was also a bit of luck. And luck and timing throughout my life, I think, is really important. So um, I, I was in New York. I bumped into a journalist from a, from a music magazine called Melody Maker. His name was Chris Charlesworth. And I said, hello, Chris, how are you? Blah, 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 what are you doing here? Started talking. He said to me, um, what are you doing tonight? I said, well, I was going to go meet some friends for a drink and then decide what to do. He said... Do yourself a favour, go down to to the uh, Bitter End, which is a small club down in the village, and forget the, uh, the the headliner, go and see the opening act. His name's Bruce Springsteen. Once you've seen him, you're going to jump in with two feet. So I said, the opening act? He said, yeah, just go and see the opening act. Uh, okay, that's my luck. By timing, I was in New York. I go down to the... Bitter end, I walk into, or, you know, buy a ticket, go into the bitter end. I think there were 40 people in the room, and I watched this act for 35 minutes. Uh, I think they played 40 in total, and I was just mesmerised. And I literally ran backstage, barged in, said, I'm the biggest promoter in Europe. I wasn't, but that's what I told them. And you have to come to Europe. And... You know, I shook his hand. I said, this was amazing. And he said, what do you mean Europe? He said, this is the first time we've ever played outside New Jersey. Forget Europe. And again, this is 1973, I think. And it took me two and a half years to get them to come to Europe, do their first tour. And obviously, from that point onwards, it just took off. And I had a huge row with a record company in England. In fact, I've had lots of rows with record companies in England because they kept asking me what department he worked in. And I go, no, 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 he signed to your label. They just never heard of him, didn't know who he was, no idea whatsoever. So it's about grabbing opportunity, and, and that's really what a, a promoter is and should be. It's, it's hearing about things, chasing it, seeing it, and if you believe in it, go for it. So I, I, I've been, I think, very lucky in my life because I started probably in the most creative period we've ever seen. That mid-60s, from about 1965 to 1972, life completely changed. It was post-war. It was the first time that young people demanded a say in society. They created new music. They came up with new ideas. There were student riots because they didn't want to, you know, the, the whole Vietnam thing was going on. People didn't want to be coerced into the army. Students wanted a say in life. And out of it came dozens and dozens of new artists, new bands, most of which are still around today. So groups like The Stones and The Who and Pink Floyd and all that kind of thing all came out of that era um, because they could. And it was the first time that they were allowed to. And in the same way, it was art, it was literature, it was painters, it was sculptors, uh, all came out of that period with a completely different viewpoint of life. And so it was the period of Andy Warhol, it was the, the period of, of J Jackson Pollock, it was the period of that change of art, and all fused together. It was the change of, of fashion and style, in terms of things like Bieber and Bus Stop and all that kind of thing, the, the advent of Twiggy and the short haircut, nobody had ever seen that before. And these were people that were just coming up with new ideas. And every week we'd get turned on to another band and we'd go and see this act and then we'd go and see that act and then we'd go and see another act. And then, and I just kind of picked it up. And for me, it was um, from a live perspective what was called vaudeville, which is music where shows that took place in the UK up until the 60s were one, twice nightly, six o'clock and 9.30. You had to have a host, an MC. You had to have a novelty act, which could be a juggler or somebody on a motorcycle or a puppet act or something completely insane in the middle. You had to have a crooner and then you were allowed some kind of popular act some normally in the beginning. So just imagine going to see a show where Jimi Hendrix was the opening act 
and Engelbert Humperdinck was the was the finale, and Cat Stevens closed the first show, and there was a guy on a fucking motorcycle wandering around the stage in the middle. Just imagine what that was like. <laughs> That's how it was. And just for me, I spent my early days um, pushing the envelope, breaking the mold. I, Deep Purple, who I met, and I went to see them. I loved their, their music. And they said to me, um, we want to do a tour, but we, we don't want to have all this other stuff. We just want to play on our own. It took me six months to persuade the, the major concert circuit, which was owned by Rank, Rank Cinemas. They were all cinemas at that point. To persuade them, one, not to do two shows on the same night, B, not to have all the other at. And I kept saying to them, I'm, I'm working with a band called Deep Purple. They want to do a whole show. And the main, the booker for Rank said, what are you talking about? I said, they're going to play for two hours. And he said, don't be ridiculous. Everybody will go home. I said, no, they won't. They want to watch one act play for a whole set. Two hours. It took me six months to persuade them, but I just didn't want to give up. And I think all the way through my life, if I believed in something, I just kept going until we got the answer. Because there's always a solution. There are people that create pathways to solve problems. And then there's a straight line. And the straight line is what you believe in. You've got to go for it. And the same today. I think one of the problems we have today is people give up too quickly. Everything's a struggle. Nobody in the early days had success for at least five years. There wasn't an act that was alive that could call themselves successful until at least three albums in. It didn't happen instantly. There were, there were shows. X Factor is a crib from a TV show that we had in England in the, in the 50s and 60s. It didn't throw up any art, or it threw up very few artists. Um, so it was always a struggle. And the struggle was that acts worked and worked and worked and worked and had an audience, and they built up that audience. And every time they came back, the audience grew a little bit more and grew a little bit more. And the strange thing was that with today, with such a vast array of opportunity to communicate through social media, through websites, through the internet, through your phone and all the rest of it, it's 50 times harder to break through than it was then when we didn't have computers. We had landlines and we had things called telex machines, which were machines that used to spew tape out that you translate into a language you could understand um, because it was focused. And today we are unfocused in our musical taste. We are unfocused in fashion. We are unfocused in style. And it's 10 times harder for talent to break through. But that doesn't mean it can't break through. It just means you've got to keep that struggle going for a bit longer. Well, look, uh, going back to, you know, I'm going to rewind a little bit because there's a lot to talk about. And I'm going to come back to your point here shortly regarding the challenges and the opportunities. So the 70s uh, was a transformational year, you know, politically, socially, etc. Just getting out of the Vietnam War, as you mentioned. So you have been in the business of creating experiences. You worked with some amazing artists in the 70s. What would you say was the one act that defined your experience in the 70s? An act that you worked with that you felt really changed the course for the music business and the work that you were doing? That's a tough... I, there wasn't one act. For me, in terms of live music, the best act on the planet was always The Who. They were the most exciting. They were an act that you never, ever knew what the hell was going on. Every time you went to see them, something else would happen. And for me, they were the most exciting. In terms of, of songs, of course, it was The Beatles. In terms of... Um, kind of excitement in, in a different way and staging it was the Rolling Stones but then you have to remember during that period people like David Bowie came up Elton John came up Yes came up Emerson Lake and Palmer came up and then 
later in the mid 70s or mid early to mid 70s where groups like genesis came up they they each one of them were different there were production type bands like genesis and 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 yes there were bands that that played where you had someone like keith emerson who was playing keyboards upside down and a, and and a drummer that uh, Carl Palmer, they used to spin round. There were bands like Van Halen coming up from America. I mean, it was just, it was an explosion. It, it, you, you actually, it was a point where you put your hand in the, in the, in the sweet tin and you didn't know what was going to come out. But everything that came out was better than the one before. And they all, at the end of the day, created music that you remember. They wrote songs that you can still sing. Today... There's, you look at, you hear on the radio, you hear an act, you go, that's interesting. And three weeks later, you go, well, what was the name of that act? I can't even remember. What was the song? I can't remember. We're in this world of instancy. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. Things evolve. But it's not a good thing either because it's leaving no lasting legacy. I think you're right. Uh, we're living in a world today where music is very trend-driven. You obviously worked in an era, 60s and 70s in particular, and even the 80s too, which we'll get to in a second, where movements were created. And from your perspective, what's the difference between a trend and creating an actual movement? Well, uh, I think in the beginning it wasn't a trend, it was just, it was a rebellion. It was a rebellion against um, the fact that up until the war, uh, young people were seen but not heard. That was always the style. And then you had the big band era and then things started to evolve. And people came out of it. At the end of the 70s and the 80s, there were movements. It was change. I mean, um, the whole... When you look at bands like Duran Duran and all that era of glam rock and Queen and so on, they, they started a movement, but it was linked to fashion. They were all linked to fashion. To some extent, David Bowie was linked to fashion. I remember doing my first concert with David Bowie in a little uh, venue called the Hemel Hempstead Pavilion. It was my Sunday night tryout. Um, I had a club um, in Harlow. I, had, um, I did Sunday nights at Hemel Hempstead Pavilion. And then later on, we, got, we were given uh, we, the Roundhouse, which is a very famous venue now, but at the time, we used to do shows in the Roundhouse and on occasion, and that became really, really an important venue for rock kind of music. Um, and um, I remember this guy calling him up saying, um, you've got to book my act. I said, who is it? He says, his name's David Bowie. And I'm going, yeah. And he said, he's going to be the biggest act in the world. I'm going, yeah. And he said, you've got to book him. I said, well, OK, well, I've got to see him first. Where do I, well, what? They said, well, he's playing in St Albans. Go and see him there. So I went over to St Albans to go and see this act play. And I thought, hmm, this is interesting. <laughs> By the time we booked him and put him on, um, and in those days, you know, again, buying a ticket was an experience. If you really wanted to see your act, people would queue up and camp outside the, the venue to buy a ticket for days. I mean, there were people queuing up for three, four days at a time, and it was all part of that experience. And we were, you know, we were going out, we were giving out, you know, soup and water and food, and it was uh, the TV cameras were coming, it was on the news. Today, shows sell out in 38 seconds on the internet, so they say, um, and then four seconds later, you can buy the ticket that apparently is sold out, but you've got to pay 500 bucks for it instead of 25 quid because, unfortunately, those tickets that sold out, sold out. But somehow we managed to get these tickets and we can resell them for 100 times more than they're worth. It's horseshit. So part of the experience was to get your ticket. You'd go down to the venue, you'd talk to other people, you'd swap stories. I went to see the act here, I saw it there, I love this band here, I bought this record, what do you think of that track? People would discuss it. Nobody discusses it today. They either watch, listen, or see the act for five seconds, they dance up and down, they go next, 
following week as another act. It's it's it is it is such a different world that we live in today. And again, I'm not saying it's bad. Things evolve, but what what set the groundswell and the grounding for all of the big acts today? The Rolling Stones are still playing. God bless them. I don't know how they are, but they are. But they're bigger today than they were in the 70s, in the 60s, you know? I did a show with Led Zeppelin. I made them, I got them all back together in 2007. We had 250 million hits and requests for 14,000 tickets. 250 million. Just think about it. It's, it was just unprecedented. Um, why? Because that band, they worked. They worked their asses off. They crafted their record. They, were, they kept themselves away. They weren't on the front page of every single newspaper. They weren't screwing this model or that TV star in other, in other to get publicity. They were real bands that art people and their fans would talk about, would listen to, would discuss, would put it inside them. And that was important. And again, today we don't do that because there's no reason to do it. And uh, I, I think that um, I think that we, we, music, like life, goes around in a cycle. I think we're at a, the bottom of the rung, and hopefully, out of it will come a new slew of ideas, new ways of doing it, new young promoters, and lots of young artists with a different attitude. With all the mess that we live in, with terrorism, with, 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 you know, no one would even dream of blowing up a concert or a concert hall. Nobody would do that. Today, that's set aside. And yet, is there one single artist that's written a song about it? Not that I know of. And yet, when I first started, everybody was writing songs that related to the Vietnam War, to what was going on in life, to the student rights in France and all that kind of business. So I, I don't know what happened. I don't know what the disconnect is. I don't know what the difference between how music comes out today and what we do and why people think they can have instant success because you can't. You have to do your work. You have to do your groundwork. And all those bands did. Well, I think those are some very valid points and I think you are absolutely right that uh, the humanization of the music experience has been taken out it's become more of a digital experience but let's you know expand upon the humanization so we've gone from the 60s and 70s and you've touched upon the 80s with some of the you know new wave bands like Duran Duran and uh, ABC etc but uh, you also decided in the mid 80s to create something that no one had ever done before a global human music experience to help those in need in Africa. Tell us about Live Aid and how that came together. Because that was... I didn't create it. That was Bob Geldof. Bob Geldof and Mijur uh, wrote the song. They got all 20-odd artists all to come together to record the song in the Christmas up to New Year. And it came out over Christmas, New Year of 1984-85. And then Bob went to Africa because it raised about... Five million pounds, I think, the song. And he went to Africa to see what to do with the, the money. And he realised when he went to Africa what a mess it was in. And so we started to see on the TV, on the news, which no one had ever seen before, um, people in Africa who were lit and kids and babies who were just starving. And the debate in Europe at the same time, what do we do with butter mountains? What do we do with fruit mountains? What do we do with all the surplus apples we've grown, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. And down the road, there were people starving, and it just didn't make any sense. So um, that movement started to grow, and um, I was had a pretty busy year. Um, I took the first Western pop band to China, which was Wham. I, Roger Waters and the Pink Floyd had split and I was looking after his solo career and he was launching his first solo record, The Pros and Cons of Hitchhiking, and we were doing, the launch was in Radio City, New York. So I was going from London to New York and from New York to Hong Kong and then to China and then I was bringing Bruce Springsteen over in the summer 
And I, that was enough for me. And Bob was banging on the door saying, you've got to help. We, we, we decided we want to do a concert. So I said, I can't even think about it till I get back from China because I'm not even sure I'll get back from China that easily because I don't know what's going on till I get there, uh, which was a whole other experience. And um, I came back from from China, which it turned out, thank goodness, to be a real success. Although when we first arrived, they didn't even know who we were, what we were doing there. There were 70 of us with the band and the crew and friends and whatever, whatever. And um, we managed to bullshit our way into China. We couldn't find our hosts who were supposed to be looking after us. And we only, we only found them at one o'clock in the morning um, the next day when this Chinese chap arrived phoned me up and said, you have to get dressed. It was half past one in the morning and I was pretty jet lagged. And he said, you've got to get dressed and, and, and meet me down in the lobby. And I'm going, it's half past one in the morning. And where the fuck have you been? And he said, oh, good news, good news. I said, what's the good news? He said, we have our license. I said, what? He said, I said, the concert's tomorrow. He said, yes, we got our license at midnight. <laughs> the day before. I was completely mad anyway. It all worked out good in the end. I came back to London. The next morning I went into my office and Bob was standing outside my office waiting to come and he sat down and he said, we have to do this. And I said, okay, I kind of, let's get our heads around it. And everybody had seen the news. I realised that something, we could do it. And for me... Most of my life has been enjoying the fruits of being in the business and taking things out. And so for me, it wasn't difficult to put something back. So we talked it through and we decided to do a show at Wembley Stadium. And then Bob said, we've got to get some TV exposure, otherwise it's not going to work. So he was discussing um, a two-hour broadcast with Channel 4, it was our fourth channel, and it was just being brokered by the head of a company called IMG that did golf tournaments. And um, I said, look, look, why don't I take you into one of the producers at the BBC and let's talk to them. He said, yeah, 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 yeah. So one Friday afternoon, we march up at the BBC, we meet with the music producer, a guy called Mike Appleton, and um, explained it to him. He took us into the head of daytime television and God bless him, the head of day, daytime television understood what we were trying to do. And Bob kept banging the table saying, I need 16 hours of television. Unheard of. <laughs> Un absolutely unprecedented. 16 hours of music on television. Are you nuts? Anyway, uh, the, the head of daytime television said, who, who realised, you know, he understood, he could see it. He said... I don't know what I can do, but I'm going to talk to the Director General on Monday and I'll get you an answer on Tuesday. And Bob, all I remember was Bob banging the table like this, going, 16 hours of television. Oh, fuck. So we, we left. Tuesday afternoon, we get a phone call, go and see the Director General. I said, Bob, do me a favour, don't come. He said, no, no, I have to come. I said, just put your hands under your under the seat, don't swear, don't shout, let's see if we can pull this off. And they said, look, we have to change all our programming around, we understand how important this is, we see the value of the record you did, whatever. What, who, what artists have you got? At which time we had not one artist other than the Boomtown Rats, that was it. And he just, he literally, he must have read the Melody Maker Top 20 and just read it out. <laughs> <laughs> Every one of them. And we didn't have a single act. And the, the director general said, if you get those acts, OK, we'll try and clear our schedules and try and make it work. And we came out of there and he was on such a high. And we went back to my office and Bob said, I've been thinking about it. England's not enough. I'm going, what? <laughs> he said, we have to do a show in America. I said, uh, OK, but we've got to do it at the same time. <laughs> And I said, I mean, he literally, we, we became yin and yang. He would come throw out some completely mad idea and I'm going, fuck you, I'm going to make it work. <laughs> so he kept saying, and I found out my equivalent in America was a guy called Bill Graham, who was like the biggest promoter in America. 
And I explained to Bill what we wanted to do, and he got it, but he lived in San Francisco, and he insisted it was going to be on the West Coast. And I looked at the satellite and the timings, and I said, no, 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 we can't do it on the West Coast. It's eight hours difference. I could do it on the East Coast of five hours difference because when we finish our concert in London, the concert in a, on the East Coast will start. If we're going to do LA, I have to wait till, you know, two o'clock in the morning. That's not going to work. And he kept insisting, insisting, and I said, forget that. Anyway, we tried to get Giant Stadium. We couldn't get it. We tried to get Shea Stadium where the Beatles play. We couldn't get it. We tried to get RFK in Washington. We tried to get Boston uh, Fields. We couldn't get that. And eventually, I called my friend Larry Maggid, who was a promoter in Philadelphia. I said, you've got to help me out here. And he said, I'll go and see the mayor. Went and see the mayor of Philadelphia. And the mayor, who was the first black mayor I think one of the first black mayors in America, and he got it instantly, and he said, I'll give you JFK uh, in Philadelphia to do this. So I phoned Bob up, and I said, Bob, great news. We've got JFK Stadium in Philadelphia, and the mayor is 100% behind what we want to do. And Bob said, Philadelphia? Who the hell knows where Philadelphia is? Forget it. And I'm going, oh, my God. So... I had to, it suddenly dawned on me, Philadelphia is the home of the Liberty Bell. And I said, Bob, this is the home of the Liberty Bell. It's the home of freedom. It's the home of hope. People will understand it. And in any event, we've got no other choices. And that's how we ended up in Philadelphia. So we had a concert in Philadelphia. We had our concert in London. And we, we spent time with BBC engineers looking at maps um, and I don't know if you know what a pair of calipers are. They're like two prongs, and you can you twist them around, twist them around, and you, and you measure the gap in between, and that tells you the distance and the time. <laughs> That's how we were trying to work out where the satellite would be at the point of which we were ending our show, and the show in, New York, in Philadelphia was starting. It was pretty wild. Harvey, you make it seem so, all so easy, don't you? <laughs> well, it, it, you know, I, I, mean, I, I don't. Un, I think if you've got an event that is meant to be, it will happen. If you've written a piece of music that's meant to be, it'll work. And I think with what the reason why we wanted to do this show, everybody got it. There's no, there was no debate about it, um, and. I think it started just to fall into place and we just kept going and kept going and kept going. I mean, it got so insane. Um, we were having meetings in my office and I had a big, uh, one of those TV sets that came out of a box and it would come up as a big screen. And uh, we were, people were sending us videos to look at. We were piling through all these videos. And uh, one morning, David Bowie came up to the office and sat down with Bob and myself. We were just talking about what he was going to do. And we were just chucking these video cassettes into the TV and looking at them. And suddenly, this um, video made by Canadian Broadcasting, um, CBC, um, of music by the cars, um, showing these um, harrowing scenes of... of, of of the camps down in, in, in Ethiopia and Sudan of, and the people coming in with kids that were emaciated and so on and so forth. They put it together really well with the music and David just stopped the conversation and said, whatever that is, just go back, rewind it, replay it. I'll give up a number. You have to put that in the show. And it was moments like that. It just came together and the whole thing just one after the other. Strangely enough, we had a press conference at in the in the main uh, ballroom area of Wembley Stadium, which is where they used to have all their do's and diddles. And um, we were all lined up in the press conference. There were more press people than I've ever seen. I think there were 480 TV, radio, and and journalists at this press conference. I've never seen that many before. And <laughs> the first question they asked was, "Who was playing?" We didn't have a single act signed. And Bob kept rattling off all these names. And about halfway through the press conference, I get called out 
And somebody said, you've got to take this phone call. So I've got to take the phone call. And it was Jim Beach calling from New Zealand. They just finished a concert in New Zealand with Queen, who was the manager of Queen, saying, what is this that you've just announced that Queen are playing? <laughs> Not anything about it. And I explained it to him, and thank God, you know, Queen decided to play. And, of course, that section, the, the Queen section with Freddie Mercury, was one of the all-time highlights of, of Live Aid. And it was like that. It was just one after the other after the other. Mick Jagger and David Bowie were trying to figure out how they could do a duet with Mick Jagger playing in, in, New York, in Kennedy, uh, uh, in um, Philadelphia, JFK, uh, and David Bowie playing in London. And we couldn't work out the difference in the sounds because of the delay. So they made me call up NASA to see if one of them could go up in a rocket. Because if you go up in the rocket and it's neutral, neutral in terms of sound, and one of them played from the rocket, by the time it came back down with the duet, it would actually be in sync. That's how crazy it got. And believe it or not, NASA took our call and were thinking about it. And then about three quarters of the way through, as we were just battling our way around, you know, every day it was, it was another meeting of madness and I and, and Bob kept saying we haven't got Phil Collins and I said well I've called Tony Smith his manager and you know Phil's humming and I said get him so I phoned Tony out I said Tony you have to get Phil Collins on this show he's one of you know at that time he was massive and he's got to play and he said well I talked to Phil and he doesn't want to do what everybody else does so I said okay what does he want to do and Tony just threw out and said, well, if Phil could play both concerts, um, he'll do it. I said, OK, fuck you, we'll do both concerts. I put the phone down and I thought, uh, and then it suddenly came to me. Concord, phone up British Airways, got through to the chief exec of British Airways. I said, I've got a great idea for you. We're doing this concert. Phil Collins, if you could lay on a concord for us a slightly earlier timing to get to Philadelphia um, in time um, I'll fill it through fill the plane up with press and, and journalists and whatever and Phil will go over and he'll start off at Wembley and from Wembley we'll get a helicopter to Heathrow and he'll get on the concord and go to New York where he can helicopter him to uh, Kennedy and they to, uh, to JFK and they said okay Sounds like a good idea. It was just like that. You could do that. And so we did. And that's what exactly what happened. Phil Collins played both in London and in Philadelphia on the same day. So, so I guess the lesson is don't ask for permission, ask for forgiveness if you uh, are doing what you mentioned earlier about uh, booking bands without their knowledge. So we're going to move to the 90s now. So you sort of shifted your focus a bit and got involved with... England's very first ever 24-hour, seven-day-a-week commercial alternative radio station, but also you got involved with one of the most successful TV pop brands, Smash Hit. So how did that whole transition happen, getting involved in radio and then also TV, but with two different sort of genres, alternative and pop? Uh, Smash Hits came first. Um, Smash Hits was uh, a UK pop magazine owned by a company called EMAP that actually also had radio stations and lots of other magazines like Farming Monthly and, you know, Bike Weekly and that Golfing Daily and that kind of thing. And Smash Hits was very popular. And it was literally a pop magazine for kids. And uh, I met with the MD of, of uh, Smash Hits and he said, um, we... we We've been thinking about Smash Hits and wondering how we could expand it. What do you think we could do? So I said, I'd like to think about it and understand a bit more. And there was a girl called Mary, I forget her surname now, who was the editor of Smash Hits. And they said, well, sit down with Mary. And we went out and had lunch and we talked about it. And we cooked up the idea of a TV show. And... Um, I went to the BBC and I said, Smash Hits a very popular magazine and we've got this idea called the Smash Hits Poll Winners Parties and we're going to do a, a show 
which we're going to do live from at the time initially for, it was at the Royal Albert Hall and then we moved it to London Arena and um, we want to feature all the top pop bands and um, the BBC again thought about it and said yeah it sounds like a good idea and they said when do you want to when do you want this to come out do you want to do it during the week 7.30 do you want it prime time on Saturday or earlier on Saturday I said no 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 I want to do this Sunday afternoon at three o'clock. And they said, why on earth would you want to put a TV show out at three o'clock on a Sunday afternoon when nobody watches it? And I said, for that very reason, because at the time, again, you only had the TV and there were remote controls, but that was it. There was no, you know, everybody sat and watched the TV. And all was, that was on on Sunday afternoon was the odd football match and a rotten film that nobody watched because it was a rotten film to start with. So because it was a dead time, I thought if we could get that period on a Sunday afternoon, then the kids can persuade their parents that's their time, they can watch TV. And it became a huge, massive success. Um, any act that played on there um, who was even unknown... Um, would guarantee to sell within five days half a million records. It was that popular, it was that important. And year after year, we would get 49% of the total share of TV audience because it was three o'clock on a Sunday afternoon. That's what it became known as. And, and also the reason why I chose that time, because on radio at 4.30 was the chart show, which again, chart shows on radio were really, really important at that point. So he went from picking up the winners on, on TV at three o'clock, finishing it. It was a 90-minute show. It was live. And then it went, and people would then go straight into the chart show to see where, what positions they were. And so we ended up um, doing a regional shows and touring. And then after about three or four years, I thought, this is an opportunity to put some new acts on. So... I started to look around and I, I had a, a big row with the BBC because they didn't really understand why on earth I'd want to put an unknown band in there. I said, because it's a great shot for an unknown act. And um, I looked around and, you know, I found bands like Boyzone had their first exposure on there. Westlife had their first exposure on uh, anywhere on, on Smash Hits. Blue, Maroon 5, New Kids on the Block, all these bands that no one had ever heard of. We used to put them on the TV show um, and that from, they would just explode thereafter until I got to the point, I was telling Sat earlier, where I suddenly got a, a phone call to go and meet with the BPI, which is the overarching um, body that represented all the record companies. So I go and meet with the BPI and the... Um, the manager director of the BPI said, um, we've had some complaints. I said, about what? And they said, about smash hits. I said, complaints? What's the problem? And they said, well, you've been choosing acts to go on there and people are complaining that it's unfair. And I'm going, I'm sc and I, I literally looking at them and I said, I don't know what you're talking about. And they're saying, people are complaining because they think you fixed the acts that you put on there. I said, fixed in what way? If you mean, have I chosen the acts? The answer is yes. Have they become successful? That's the power of the TV show. That's why we're doing it. They said, you can't do that anymore. And I said, why not? And they said, because we'll black the TV show. We won't allow any acts to play on it. And I kind of stepped back and th I actually really at the time did not understand what they were talking about. But what they made me do was then put in a voting procedure I had to go and hire a team of accountants from KPMG and bank tellers from Barclays Bank that would go to every venue because we, we put these acts on, a, on the tour first just to see how good they were so that at every night on every show, the audience in the arena had to vote and we had ballot boxes and Lord knows what else because people were complaining that I was giving acts unfair advantage. I mean, that's how stupid life was. But anyway, but it worked. But we had so many hits out of it. Kylie Minogue broke out of it. Um, I say, new kids on the block, blah, 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 blah. 
and we I produced that for 18 years and it was really successful so and the reason I'm telling you this is because um, I then got a phone call from the kills manager and um, Robert Smith and the kills manager had an idea about an indie radio station and they came to see myself and my ex-partner and they said look we want to start an indie radio station we want to tr we have to get past the radio authority and we think you could help us do you want to join in so in the same way as we had smash hits for pop there was no outlet for indie music to get heard on radio there just wasn't so we went to see the radio authority and they said no 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 we're not going to do that too edgy and we said that's the whole purpose of it and they gave, there was an, a national franchise going and we lobbied and lobbied and lobbied for it. We couldn't get it because it went to Classic FM because obviously the MPs and whatever saw classic music was more important than indie music. But we kept going. We formed this group um, and Robert and Chris Parry, who was the Cure's manager, and we brought in a, a radio programmer called Sammy Jacob, and, we, and we, we stuck it out and stuck it out. And we went in, and two years later, we managed to persuade the radio authority, who gave us an FM franchise, and we started XFM. And uh, again, it just proves the point. If you keep pushing and pushing and pushing hard enough, you'll get there in the end. And then that was the first indie rock station in, in England. That certainly has been transformational in breaking so many British acts yeah. over the years. Yeah. So I know we only have, unfortunately, about uh, another seven minutes, and there's still so much to talk about. So we're going to skip a decade, unfortunately, and kind of fast forward to uh, 2018. Now, Harvey, you never get bored. You're always pushing the envelope. You're always thinking, creating, you know, inspiring. Uh, recently, you did the Hans Zimmer Worldwide Tour, a composer for, t for film doing a tour. It's been a sellout. It's been amazing. I've watched uh, the documentaries on PBS in the States and have yet to go to the festival, but uh, or the tour, sorry, because it's all sold out. But that's been an amazing experience. Yeah. Hans Zimmer is, um, is a German film composer who was born in Mannheim, grew up, went to school in England, lived in England, and he uh, started his life in a rock band called Krakatoa, which he, I think he performed in about three times and then spent more, and, and he was working in very, very early days on, on synths. And um, in those days, synths were about the size of the stage. <laughs> and um, anyway, he then progressed. And in fact, he was the synth player in the Buggles video, Killed the Music. Uh, so, um, he, um, he'd been in the pop world and through that, by some quirk of fate, he got lured to write the music for a, big, for a Ridley Scott film. And then he ended up going to America and became hugely successful, has written the music for 158 or 160 movies, everything from recently Dunkirk, to Blue Planet for BBC, to The Crown, which is a very successful TV series about our royal family on Netflix, to Batman, Superman, um, and onwards, and Pirates of the Caribbean, and uh, Gladiator, and Driving Miss Daisy, and blah, 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 blah. So, I, I and also a whole series of kids' films. And it, the, it, it it's taken me a long time, again, persistence, 2012, I get a phone call from Steven Spielberg doing the launch of a film called Kung Fu Panda for kids. And they wanted to do Kung Fu Panda too. They wanted to get some excitement. And they said, have you heard the music from the film? And I said, mm, no, I haven't watched the film either. <laughs> but nevertheless, he said, they said, listen to the music. We'll call you back. So they called back and they said, have you listened to the music? I said, yes, yeah, kind of unusual. I said, who wrote the music? And they said, Hans Zimmer. I said, oh, I've heard of him. He's a really good film composer, isn't he? They said, yeah. And they said, would you put together um, something different for us to do the premiere of the film and also for Hans to bring some musicians over and play the music? 
So that's a good idea. So we thought about it and we put together a kind of family day out in a park called Allthorpe, in a stately home called Allthorpe, which was owned by Princess Diana's brother. And um, we put a family day out, we put a big screen up for kids to watch the film. And then at the end of the film, as it's starting to get a little bit about six o'clock, seven o'clock, we played the music live from the film and it went down a storm. And believe it or not, 10,000 people pitched up, much to my amazement. So I thought, this is interesting. So I met Hans Zimmer, I talked to him. I said, you've got to do more. And he said, yeah, 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 yeah. And he went back. He was in the middle of doing, I don't know, the last Batman film, I think, or maybe it was Superman, something like that. It then I chased him for two years. I kept going over to LA, down to show, hi, Hans, uh, it's Harvey. Oh, yeah, 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 how are you, blah, blah. I said, you've got to perform live. He said, yeah, yeah, but I'm in the middle of doing some movies and you know I'm busy and whatever, and can you come back later? And I just kept going on. I kept going to LA, kept going to see the studio. And eventually I said, Hans, you've got to do something live. And he, he doesn't have a manager, he has a business partner. And I talked to his business partner. I said, Steve, you've got to persuade Hans. He has a whole world in front of him. He can't spend his whole life in the studio, I'll go nuts after a while. So... 2014, I persuaded Hans to do two concerts at Hammersmith Apollo, which he did. And we talked about how to do it, and he said, what I don't want to do is to do a concert where I'm playing the music and the film's above. I said, I want to play my music and create the emotion of the music using light and sound. So I said, okay. So we put this whole team together of creative people, and we designed a stage and um, also the lighting and we used the Pink Floyd's lighting designer to come up who also did U2 and, and, um, and, um, uh, and Bruce Springsteen as well for, for a while and we got him to create the mood and we called and I said let's call the show Hans Zimmer Revealed so you could reveal yourself. So we created this image of Hans looking at his desk with thousands of cables and wires coming out in the keyboards. And we called it Hans Zimmer Revealed. And we did these two shows and they were a fantastic success. That was 2014. It then took me two more years to persuade him to actually do more dates. And finally, he gave me a period and he said, I'd like to do it. He said, but the only thing is, if I'm going to do these shows, I'm petrified of going on a stage. You have to come with me. So in 2016, we did our first tour of Europe, which we played in arenas, which was a massive, massive success. And we had, I didn't realise how many fans that he had, nor did he. We built up all the social media. We, we, we really did it properly. And then word got out from the first show that we did to the next, to the next, to the next. And it was a massive success. And then in 2017, we went to Australia and we, I persuaded um, Golden Voice, who are the, the owners of, uh, of the Coachella Festival, to play Coachella. They didn't know what I was talking about. They had no concept of what I was saying. And they said, yeah, we'll put him in one of the small tents somewhere. So I said, no, 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 you don't understand. We have 55 musicians on stage. We have a stage set that has to be built up. We have to have these... And, we battled with them until literally three weeks before the first Coachella. And um, eventually they backed off and said, OK, you can go on the second stage. And we said, OK, thank you very much. We're on the second stage. I said, but we have to go on in daylight, going twilight into darkness. So I want to start in daylight, finish in darkness. And they said, why do you want to do that? I said, because it will be for us. That's how we want to create the, the environment. So they gave us an hour. We had 15 minutes to set up. <laughs> we had to set up 55 musicians on this deck stage with Mike in it. I mean, it was, we eventually came to an accommodation with the headliners who some kind of hip hop something out. I never heard of them personally, but never mind. And we started and we did the first Coachella on the second stage. 
And as about five minutes before we started to play, I counted 17 people in the area watching it. And I thought, hmm. <laughs> anyway, hands, we assemble all the musicians and the orchestra starts to go on stage and we had 24 piece choir. They went on stage, then the band went on stage and then finally hands and he started playing. Literally, I think he must have got through 10 or 12 bars of music and it was like the lemmings coming out of nowhere. There were people coming from every part of the park and by about the second number, the end of the second number, the, the promoters told me there were 90,000 people watching our show and poor old Kendrick Lamar and Lord got completely fucked. <laughs> but nevertheless, we're proud of that. Because people had never seen an orchestra on stage before. As we were travelling around, I mean, Europe's much, strangely enough, Europe is so much more sophisticated in America. Most of the kids in America didn't know what an orchestra was, had never seen that many musicians on stage. They knew the music, but they didn't understand how it worked. I mean, it was quite mind-blowing, to be honest. Um, but everywhere we went, it, it's just been a huge success. And we're going out again next year. <laughs> well, look, I, I think, uh, you know, you've uh, been a true inspiration, not only to me for so many years, but so many other people around the world. And, you know, you're not 50 years old in the music business, you're 50 years young because you're constantly pushing the envelope, constantly, you know, thinking of new ideas, finding new solutions. When people say no, you say yes, and you find a way to do it. And that's a really big inspiration to everybody in the room. And I know we're running out of time, so unfortunately we're not going to have time for questions. But uh, one question I, I have to ask you, which we did, spoke about last night briefly. You've not written a book. You've not done a documentary or a movie about your amazing life. Is that possibly in the works? Um, I keep thinking about it. And I keep thinking, if I do a book, it's kind of closure. I'm not quite sure I'm ready for it yet. I might. I might. I should, I guess. But... I think if there's anything, you know, I, 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 I've started to do a few of these conferences and people always ask the same, how do we break through? How do we get an agent? How do we get a manager? What do we do? I think the key is, one, you've got to believe in yourself. Two, you've got to be able to write a song because at the end of the day, our business depends on songs or music that's got to be great. And three, you've got to know how to pr perform it and present it. If you've got those three bits together in one go, it's only a matter of time before you'll get to the next stage and break it through. And then you have to get a team around you that can believe in what you do and prepare to give their lives up to help you break it through. It isn't easy. But of course, there's so much talent around and talent does break through. It does rise to the surface. And there's some fantastic talent. I just hope that we have a new generation, not only talent in front of the stage, but also new talent behind the stage. Because when I started, you know, I had to battle my way through the existing system. And I don't see that with young promoters. I don't see young promoters trying to beat the system. They always bleat and moan, they phone me up and say, you know, we can't get any acts. I said, well, find your own acts. You know, the agents won't talk to us. I said, fuck the agents. Go and just find the acts and you agent them. You know, you've got to believe in yourself. You've got to believe in what you're doing. Nobody ever said the music business was easy, but the rewards and the satisfaction are fantastic. Well, without a uh, word of advice or advice, um, advices, let's give a very nice big thank you to Mr. Harvey Goldsmith for an inspiring <laughs> conversation and... Uh, I wish we had more time. So, Harvey, I know that uh, you're always so generous with uh, speaking to people. So if you have a question for Harvey when he gets off stage, I'm sure you'll be willing to spend a bit of time to have a chat. All right, thank you.